Hi, everyone, and welcome to our annual Yogacharya Oliver birthday celebration that we hold every year here at Song of the Morning Ranch. Today, our program is called 50 Years of Joy because we're also celebrating 50 years of our existence as Song of the Morning Ranch. This year, we've asked our various speakers to talk about many of the wonderful events that have happened throughout the 50 years of the existence of Song of the Morning Ranch. Yogacharya Oliver was called a joy yogi, and I think it's appropriate that we celebrate his birthday with all the joyful things and all the joyful people we've had here throughout the years. Glida Golden Lotus Yoga Teachers Association was um, considered the right arm of the ranch because we taught classes to the public, got them interested in yoga, and then Yogacharya could further their knowledge about the philosophy and master's teachings. And none of our um, events, any activities that we do, our yoga classes, anything has, um, is anything in conflict with SRF. As a matter of fact, we use the SRF guidelines as our guidelines. We hold our teacher training program each year. Um, it usually meets every three weekends here at the ranch, and we have about six to ten students. And we like to hold it here at the ranch because then they get the experience of feeling the beauty of nature, feeling the energy from uh, 50 years of like-minded people teach, uh, meditating here every day. And many of the students come to us um, for our teacher training because of the spiritual aspect to it. Um, they want more than just the yoga postures and anatomy. They want to know the true teachings, the um, benefits for the mind, the body, the spirit. So we go into a lot of that. We do many other things, too. We have the annual spring banquet, and um, that's a fundraising project for the ranch. We also hold workshops and retreats. Um, teaching with Yogananda's teachings so that um, our teachers and the public can deepen their experience of yoga. So I'm very happy to be part of this organization that Yogacharya started so many years ago. And it takes a lot of dedicated people to um, keep an organization going for 50 years and more. Um, and especially with Yogacharya's standards of excellence and joy, we're always trying to uphold his standards. Um, Yogananda once said that we don't belong to SRF, to Self-Realization Fellowship. We are Self-Realization Fellowship. And the same is true with the Teachers Association. We don't just belong to the association. We are the association. And it takes a lot of dedicated people, and we have that. And so I'm so happy to be a part of it. We've been doing these services for 50 years, um, nightly meditations, um, Sunday services, longer meditations, special services, and so on. Um, it was a great tradition with Yogacharya, that is, you never missed. You were always there. He was always there. So it um, become ingrained. And we do these services sometimes with determination as much as devotion. It doesn't matter how many people are there, it matters that the intent is continually there. Um, 
because meditation is the core of this tradition. It builds the energy around both community and um, the reinforcement effect in your own being of having other people meditate. Um, even, even if people come who are restless or um, don't, you know, aren't really comfortable with meditation yet, it's, um, it's still of benefit both to them and to us. Um, it, it's something that's uh, it's kind of subtle, so you can't, uh, it's not an overt thing, but it builds, it just builds, and, and it solidifies who we are here in, on this land uh, and what we're doing here. So 50 years of joy. I always found it with Yogacharya that the meditations were um, grueling <laughs> for me at the time, personally. Uh, it was the after effect was joy. That is, um, you didn't always get your results in meditation. You got it after, with the added bonus that he would stay and talk after every meditation. One of the things I've been involved with is um, the audio tapes of Yogacharya's meditations. And this happened soon after I met Betty Howard, who was the leader of the Chicago SRF group. And she was getting reel-to-reel -reel tapes that were recorded at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Yogacharya was a SRF minister. Every Sunday, he would conduct an SRF service, and they would have reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, and they would be recording the services. These are extraordinary, I thought, at the time. And the fact that we have these recorded, I think, is very... It, it leaves a legacy of Yogacharya Oliver, because he's essentially giving masters instructions and meditations and philosophies and uh, his approach to learning yoga meditation in, in his own words. So skip ahead to a few years later, we would sometimes use these archival tapes. And um, lately, we've been transferring them to a digital format because they ha it hadn't been done yet over all these years. So one of my projects is to take the uh, real to real tapes and transfer them to a digital format. Now the, the entire SRF service is also recorded on these tapes, but the, um, I deeply appreciated the audio of, of his own meditations. Uh, uh, somehow I connected with it and so did many others. So we are using these now, and uh, this all ties together with the latest CD that is going to be coming out. It is the third CD, and it's called How to Attune with Divine Will. And it has the voice of Yogacharya Oliver uh, giving a reading of uh, Paramahansa Yogananda's own words from a service reading, and also it has a complete meditation and it also includes music. Another uh, project that we had in the past was recording music with um, for some of Yogacharya's earlier tape projects. The first time that I ever recorded in a recording studio was in the early 70s, around 1972. So Peggy Braden and I rehearsed some of the chants, and the producer was Marilyn Becker. And we went in there and recorded the chants with vocals and organ. And we, I believe we still have copies of those recordings. They, they were used on some of the, the projects that Yogacharya Oliver uh, produced. So this comes around to the latest CD that we're coming out with. It should be out in September 2020. And it includes at least three or four musical recordings from this collection of chants that were recorded in the past at least 30 years ago, sometimes 40 or almost 50 years ago. So um, 
surprisingly, the recordings held up pretty well. So that, that these chants will be interspersed with the recordings of the voice of Yogacharya. And uh, just the previews, a little bit of feedback I've gotten from the previews I've given some people has been very good. So we're looking forward to this release of the new CD. It was 1975, and um, the members from actually the Detroit Self-Realization Fellowship Group um, raised $30,000 and bought uh, DC-3. DC-3 is kind of a romantic plane for older, you know, at that period. It was a workhorse used all over the world. It could carry, I think, 16 to 18 passengers. Um, Yogacara used to um, remind us that 60% of the U.S. population lived within 500 miles of Detroit and slightly more from Song of the Morning Ranch. And it was his idea that it would um, save the members a lot of time and effort if we could um, uh, pick them up in the nearby cities. So um, we kept the plane at the Gaylord Airport and um, we would fly to Toronto and pick up members and bring them up here for a few days and then fly them home. And instead of driving eight to nine hours, uh, it might be you know, a two and a half hour flight. We, uh, well, as well as Toronto, we would uh, fly uh, for a Kriya initiation, which Yogacara gave in Detroit at the Detroit Institute of Art. So we would fly the staff down there and other members from the area. And then after, we would bring them up here for a few days and uh, fly them home. So there were cities like Chicago and Milwaukee, which were all nearby flights. It was part of his idea, too, that um, members would enjoy vacationing with each other and have similar interest. And if you've ever done a charter flight, it's so much more relaxed than commercial flight. You know, you worry about your luggage getting lost or anything. It was, as it turned out, uh, it was a little more expensive than we could afford. So um, we weren't able to keep it up. But I think like a lot of things Yoga Charter started, uh, it was the prototype, the idea that was important. The um, establishment of a fire department that we had here. So our guys um, had the opportunity to go into Gaylord to uh, learn firefighting. And that was offered, um, I think, through the state. So several of our um, of our personnel um, did that, and then we also purchased a fire engine that was housed here at Song of the Morning, um, and that was. Um, some negotiation, we managed to get that for very little money, actually. Um, of course, as time goes on, um, things change. So there was a big period of time when there was not a fire engine. Uh, now we do have a new one, and uh, that one is housed here at Song of the Morning, again in our new maintenance building. I finally got on staff uh, in uh, 73, I was on staff 73, 74, and I was really blessed and privileged to be living with him in the boathouse and at Parkside at his house, doing various and sundry. And in the course of that time, I started to realize that, I mean, the man is a true visionary and really had some amazing ideas for what was going to be going on uh, at Song of the Morning Ranch. And the ideas were so compelling and so real to all of us who were there at that time that we still see them as real today. I mean, he really inculcated in us a true vision of what this place is going to be. While we were uh, working at his house, he came, called me over and he said, listen, um, I have a great idea. Um, we're going to do a yoga university. And I said, really? Hmm. Right before I came on staff, I had just finished all my graduate schoolwork. And uh, I had not 
finished my master's thesis yet. So I said to him, well, Yogacharya, while you're talking about universities, I really don't have my, you know, credentials yet. He said, great, you're going to fly to Montreal and do your, your defense of your thesis. And I was like, okay, I don't know why I have to do this. He said, you must do this. I got my credentials. And then he said, all right, we're going to do the first university session. And I said, really? Like how? He goes, well, you'll figure it out, sort of like convocation. Um, and you're going to bring people from Detroit. And I planned certain classes. But all of the classes had to be practical applications of Yogananda's principles. So we had a class in organic gardening using his, uh, Yogananda's diet and all of that. We had a class, uh, I, I think I did spiritual storytelling. We had a class on art. We had, and then the, we had a class on gardening, uh, by the way, that included mulching. It was very specific. Um, and we had all of these classes and people signed up for them and they went around and, and took them. And he said, all right, look, this is the start of what we're, is going to be happening. And we are going to have these things. And in order to get people to go, we're also going to have an airplane that is going to take people from place to place. And we're all like, yeah, really? Well, sure enough, <laughs> he bought a DC-3 and it flew people from Toronto to the ranch. And um, I was the air hostess on the first flight. It was really fun. So this, this was an inkling, a glimmering of what was going to happen in the future. He wanted to give us a taste of what it would feel like and what it would be like. And of course, every night after meditation, he'd have his long, wonderful talks and his talks at dinner. And it was an incredible experience because all the people that were there were really the first class of that yoga university. I moved up in, here in, to Gaylord in 1971. And in 1974, I decided to, if I wanted to come out to the ranch, I would have to, I wanted to serve, and I would want to bring my children, so I started the Sunday school. But there was a need, because there were people moving up that wanted to come to the ranch and see the Yogacharya, and people that wanted to, um, you know, st live here, live up here, and they would come every Sunday, and they had children and they couldn't go to the service. So I, you know, Yogacharya and I talked and he, we all thought that it would be a good time to um, start a Sunday school. I did it for 20 years, so it was a long time to, I had a lot of fun teaching. And um, we took walks and we would um, meditate. Well, we said our prayer and meditate and played a lot and did there was different age groups, like from three to 12. And sometimes there were four kids and sometimes there were 12. And, um, but I think I figured out, estimated that maybe a thousand kids went through the Sunday school over that time, 20 years or, um, and the 15 years of the Jump for Joy, because there would be different people would come. So a lot of people were introduced to yoga that way in the early days. Yogacara often said that um, uh, you could provide anything physically or spiritually through focusing on meditating and focusing on the spiritual eye. Um, he, himself said that he saw everything, even mundane things. He called it his TV. He said that um, if you go to the Old Testament, uh, all the prophets and seers solved problems. Uh, and he saw they would, if you look at the start of all the chapters of the Old Testament, they'd say, I saw in a vision or I heard a voice spake in my ear. Well, it was the same with Yogacara. Um, everything, practically everything that he helped to create or guide people to create in the ranch, he saw in his spiritual eye, including um, like the wheelhouse, uh, a blend of Eastern and Western architecture. A lot of things he had were his needs he saw in society. One, he had a, a cure for leukemia and another one he was shown, I think by master, uh, in this case, uh, a cure for the common cold. 
And in that way, he was often looking for the right person, like a doctor who he could work with. Some of Yogacara's inventions, these are a couple that a lot of the members, earlier members might uh, remember. This is one called a Unishelter, and um, it had multiple uses. It could be used for storing things. And then we had a, a smaller one that was more of kind of a, a fun thing. You're using it on the beach as a cabana. Other ideas was it could be used um, for photography as a tent, ice fishing shanty, or, you know. So these were uh, some of Yogacara's inventions. And another one he had that uh, was never realized was a flying saucer. A lot of people were, found that interesting. Um, oh, and the one, um, the converter plane, uh, it was a short takeoff and landing, but the difference between that and other designs was this, the whole wing was on a huge spar. His idea in that was um, he was hoping that he could uh, partner with the U.S. government and they would get the military rights and they would help us develop the civilian uh, adaption of that plane. Another one that we used here actually was called the Cluster Bed Company. The significance of his inventions is that, um, for instance, Frank Lloyd Wright was a friend of his and the great architect. Apparently he said that he had enough work to last him lifetimes, you know, designs that he never got done. So I think it's, it's, it's a capability of everybody, whether it's a, an actual invention or a new way of doing something like maybe musically or, or in cooking, whatever. So it's part of our innate, um, uh, capacity as a, a child of God and having um, that within us. So that, that's what I take from Yogacara's uh, uh, work. Throughout the years since our founding, we have maintained communication with Self-Realization Fellowship, seeking to nurture and clarify our relationship with the Mother Center and we have welcomed and appreciated multiple visits across the years by the SRF monastics. In June 2013, we welcomed Brother Jayananda and Brahmachari Martin, who offered a well-attended uh, retreat out here under a tent, and they met with us in the boathouse, the Golden Lotus Board. We discussed the possibility of more frequent visits and explained that our long-range goal was to have some sort of recognition in a more formal way with Self-Realization Fellowship as a way of securing the continuity of Master's teachings. Brother told us that we were good people, eclectic and liberal, and that things move slowly with SRF. But he said to us, it is clear that Master and Yogacharya care a lot about what happens. In time, a solution will be found. Five years later, in April of 2018, Brother Satyananda, head minister at Lake Shrine, and Brahmachari Yonik also visited. And again, they offered a retreat, a one-day retreat, also very well attended. And they joined the Golden Lotus Board for brunch the following day before their departure. Brother commented that we are positioning ourselves for the future. What we explained, however, was that what we want to really turn our focus to was the spiritual infrastructure of Song of the Morning. He encouraged us to focus on what he called the spiritual living aspect of Master's mission. He acknowledged that as a community, we are an expression of Master's great wish for World Brotherhood colonies or communities, and that it's, as such, we were focusing on an aspect of his work that SRF had not made their focus. He encouraged us to develop this part of our work 
and to remain in contact with SRF, taking small, doable steps that would help to deepen the relationship. Our board has taken Brother Satyananda's words to heart and has dedicated energy these past several years to considering approaches for strengthening our commitment to Master's teachings, deepening our expression of spiritual community, and serving the spiritual needs of those who come. And we continue to reach out to SRF to explore how our relationship with them might evolve into something tangible and sustaining over time. I first became aware of Bob Raymer in the early 1970s, hearing Yogacharya mention his name several times, that he was a brother disciple of Yogananda, an SRF lay minister, airline pilot, and friend that had lived in Minneapolis before moving to California after Yogananda passed in 1952. Yogacharya maintained that Bob would someday take over the ranch after his passing. So I was being primed from many sources to eagerly seek out his presence when I learned he was coming to the ranch from his Maui retreat center in June of 1990 to put on the first of many powerful clear light healing seminars. In the fall of 1991, he agreed to leave his beloved Maui retreat and come to live at the ranch full time, where he served as spiritual director and president of the Golden Lotus Board until 2004, when he resigned for declining health issues. Under Bob's inspiring leadership, the Clearlight community was planned, approved by zoning, infrastructure was installed, and leases began to be sold. Bob's example and life pattern was consistent with what I call the Yogananda of the autobiography. He spent many years seeking out the darshan of highly realized beings in ashrams in India, absorbing their blessings and teachings, and also drawing many, many saints to himself over the years, such as Swami Muktananda and Shiva Baliyogi who stayed with him on some of their early tours of the USA. By the time I met him at the ranch, he had a rich treasure store of over 40 years of energies, teachings, and experiences to share and transmit, especially in demonstrating manifestations of divine Shakti. His healing retreats and meditations with the help of incredibly talented, dedicated spiritual aspirants and musicians, created energy fields of profoundly sublime experience. I shall always be grateful for having been blessed by Bob's friendship and inspiration. When Ann and I first came to the ranch, we felt it was like Shangri-La, heaven on earth. But there wasn't a place for families to live here. When we would go home, I couldn't get the ranch out of my head. I wanted so much to live here someday. But it just wasn't possible. We were married, we had children, there's no way to be on staff. But then I heard about the idea of World Brotherhood colonies, which Master began to develop in the late 40s. And he asked Yogacharya in developing a retreat to also develop a yoga university and a world brotherhood colony. There are two trees by the um, wheelhouse, two spruce. And Mr. Black had a dream one night. And in this dream, those two spruce trees multiplied and they spread themselves throughout the world. And he took that dream to mean that the World Brotherhood colony that he was planting the seed for here at the ranch would spread throughout the world. And in fact, Yogananda said it, this idea would spread like wildfire. We could not have gotten the community off the ground had not it been for, th <clears throat> for three people who took 
who gave of their time freely and who took no remuneration, not even for their own personal expenses. So in addition to the help of Yogananda, Yogacharya, and Baba, we have Don de Vucastle to thank. <clears throat> Don was a uh, staff member, but he was also a lawyer, and he had had experience in condominium development. He worked tirelessly to set this up in consultation with a nonprofit lawyer. And in so doing, we set up a board of directors of a for-profit corporation called Clear Light Community Management Corporation, which protects the nonprofit status of Golden Lotus. There are two other people without whom this <clears throat> Clear Light community would not be here, and that is Carol and Richard Armour. They have given of themselves selflessly for over 20 years and longer to develop the community. The rest of us on the board just go along for the fun. Uh, we do do extra work, but Carol and Richard have lived and breathed the community for over 20 years. One day Bob Raymer said, it's time. And so Carol and Richard pulled together a committee that eventually became Clear Light Community Management Corporation. Bob said that living in the community would be fun and it really is. And it was lots of fun to, to plan this. It was just a joyous experience. We laid out about 70 lots, varying from a half acre to a full acre. These can be leased for one's life and renewed for uh, indefinitely. We have 35 lots that have been leased and there are about 35 more to be leased. We have 10 homes now on the property after 20 years. And Yogacharya said that spiritual things grow slowly, and that's really true. Here at the ranch, in being a community member, you can do anything you want to uh, take on any project that you like, or you can do nothing at all. No one is going to bother you. There's, there's no expectation, which makes everything you do a love offering and, and adds to the sense of, of freedom and, and delight and enjoyment here. We have a community garden. We also have a care team. And so we're looking for the future as we get older. We are putting things in place so that we can take care of, e of each other. The community also takes part in sponsoring Yoga Fest. And many members of the community are also Golden Lotus yoga teachers. And so we have a wonderful active life. I can't I can't tell you how, how fortunate we feel to live here in what Yogacharya called a haven of safety. In 1989, for Yogacharya's birthday, um, I felt a need to assist the ranch with a dependable source of income. Uh, so we started Circle of Friends. Initially, there were 66 uh, members donating to it. Uh, for Yogacara's birthday party, normally we gave him something that we thought he'd enjoy, but uh, you know, one time I remember we raised money for a car, another for a comfortable chair. But this time we, we did uh, this as a gift, and so we wrote all the names on a long scroll, and then somebody presented it at the birthday and unrolled it in front of him. He got a kick out of that. Little did we know that um, Yogacara was going to pass away you know, in just two weeks. So I think it was um, kind of fitting that we all um, took part in helping to continue his work. He always, Yogacara always said that it, it takes many souls, many people to accomplish something like this project. Um, I've always enjoyed, and I think others do, in um, uh, donating to the work of helping uh, carry on Yogacara and Yogananda's master's vision. The summer that I came here in 2014, one of my most distinct memories was walking into the organic garden and I literally felt like I was transported into another world. I feel how much that space just gives life and brings people together in a very different way 
And there is something so powerful about coming together around growing food and having your hands in the soil and being under the beautiful blue sky. And I think that a big part of Song in the Morning's history is centered around having a garden, a place where people grow their own food, where the retreat center is self-sufficient in that way. The garden has been there since almost the beginnings of the retreat center. And that one of the staff members in the early years of Song of the Morning decided to um, take the lead on organizing the garden. And she actually designed the garden in the shape of the SRF lotus symbol so that from the sky you could see that shape. And I um, can only imagine how amazing and incredible that must have been to be a part of. After that, there was other people who took over the garden and um, through the years, sometimes it was team collaborative efforts, sometimes it was one individual really taking the lead. But no matter what, the garden was a part of the retreat center and a part of the experience of being here, eating the fresh produce that was grown with so much love and dedication in that, in that soil and that it was just brought right down to the retreat center before garden to table or farm to table was hip and cool. It was what was happening here. And it's just one, I think one thing that illuminates how much Song in the Morning is a space that is creating a vision for the future. So since I've been here in the last, the last few years, one of the big developments has been the acquisition of a hoop house. And the hoop house was actually obtained through a grant. And that was a huge gift because hoop houses are expensive. So the hoop house is really amazing because when you're in the north, northern region like this, the growing season is quite short. So the hoop house allows an extension of the growing season so we can have crops in the ground earlier and we can grow things that usually require a little bit more heat and warmth and protection. And then we also can extend the season so we can grow further into the fall. And alongside all of that this summer, we decided, you know what, what if we did a community supported agriculture pilot program this summer and invited just some people in the community who we know a little bit better, who we felt like would be down for something new that where there's no guarantees. The CSA has been really successful. We've been able to offer baskets of produce for the past six or seven weeks, and it'll continue into the fall. One thing I've heard community members say that Yogacara used to say is that Song of the Morning was created to be a haven of safety. And part of what that haven of safety entailed was being self-sufficient and being able to produce what was needed for the people who lived here so that there'd be less dependence and um, less vulnerability with the ever-changing circumstances in our world. And the garden is certainly a part of that vision of creating, um, creating a haven of sustainability and safety and well-being for the people who are living here and for beyond and the community surrounding us. As many of you know, several years ago, the Golden Lotus Board uh, voted to eventually renovate the boathouse to create a designated chapel in the upper space. And that last year, the board gave the go-ahead to begin plans for the renovation. Last birthday uh, weekend, exactly a year ago, uh, we met with many of you in the upper boathouse to begin together to envision what that renovation might include, what the chapel might look like, how a memorial space, a museum might be created to, uh, to share Yogacharya's, um, his books, his artifacts, letters from Master. And of course, uh, the importance of the boathouse is that it, the upper boathouse was the living quarters for Yogacharya during his time on our property. There are some members who uh, stayed and helped to attend to his needs there and many who were on staff and who came to visit who spent precious time with him there in that apartment. And so the idea of renovating that space to create a sacred space designated just for that is uh, something that is uh, just um, very, mu very much in the hearts and minds of many of our members as it is ours here.
Our great hope for this birthday weekend is a gift to Yogacharya, but also to all of you, was to have architectural designs ready to share and to have a phased plan for how we envision moving forward. And of course, what we didn't know was that COVID-19 was about to strike and that a shutdown would rearrange and refocus our attention on keeping our doors open, taking care of staff so they can continue to serve. So those plans are in God's hands. But what I can tell you is that without any formal fundraising, there are a number of you that have, just because of the specialness of this project to your own hearts, given generously to help seed the beginning stages of this project. And on behalf of everyone here, I would like to just extend um, a heartfelt thank you and know that when God and Gurus uh, deem possible, we will continue with the project. Staff at Song in the Morning, um, there's been uh, just a beautiful, long, and rich history of souls coming to spend a good amount of time in their lives at Song of the Morning, um, to both serve, but to also be served in many ways by the experience um, offered that is, you know, what life offers all of us, but at Song of the Morning, it's really a heightened and um, rich experience of personal growth. There have been different configurations of staff over the years, but at this current moment, and for the past couple of years, really, what we've really been working on is how do we create one community at Song of the Morning so that the staff, the residential staff, are truly just members of this community who also happen to uh, serve in a staff role for the retreat. With that established staff group of people, and then we have the flowing in and flowing out of work exchange, which is, um, just in my opinion, one of the greatest programs that we have at Song of the Morning because it allows just a mini experience um, longer than a weekend, which is wonderful for people to come for a weekend and you get to relax and um, maybe learn a little bit about yourself and be in beautiful nature. But to be able to be here longer, Yogacharya consecrated every inch of this retreat center. And there's just something about coming onto are coming into consecrated space that can sound really wonderful to people when they're first hearing about it. <laughs> like, yeah, I really want to learn about myself. And then you come to Song of the Morning and you spend a little time, especially those on work exchange. And what you find is that those things that we need to learn about ourselves are not always so comfortable. The really, I think, beautiful experience that we can glean at Song of the Morning is that um, all of those things that are triggering us and that are prompting us to grow and um, come closer to God and come closer to self and the divine, all of those things, especially the most uncomfortable or disturbing ones, um, are actually the greatest gifts that we could be receiving. And Song of the Morning is a pretty amazing place. And we're very, very privileged to have this place um, within which to learn those lessons. So the staff, absolutely, they do work. They run a retreat center. They create programs and make meals and um, take care of the facilities and the garden and serve guests and do all kinds of things. But first and foremost, we are serving that ultimate goal, which is to know God and to bring other people then into a space where that is held up as the highest ideal. I think it was either 2008 or 2009. A couple of people got together and started um, what we now call the Genesis Fund. And it was set up specifically because it was a time when we had many things that needed to be transformed into their next level. And um, being a nonprofit that kind of gets by with, with what we can. We needed all the, the funds that we had for day-to-day -day operations. So this fund was started specifically for money to be raised that would not 
go to day-to-day -day operations, but um, would be used for things like upgrading or improving or constructing. When Yogacharya opened this retreat center in 1970, he took on the full financial responsibility of seeing this project through for the rest of his life. We had not even the slightest worry or care about the cost of maintaining buildings, construction, housing staff, purchasing food, and the myriad of items necessary to run our spiritual home. We all gave what we could, but he was behind it all, and he personally made sure that all ends were met. The Genesis Fund offers an invitation to those that have the means, the will, and the desire to step up to a higher level of commitment on behalf of Yogacharya and the mission he was given by Master Yogananda. We are asking for dedication on a level of consciousness that offers foundational stability to his work to assure of its evolution during our lifetime. So that was what was said in, I think, 2008 or 2009. And these are the projects the Genesis Fund has backed up or been behind. One, of course, upgrading the computers, hardware, and software. Two, remodeling the office area with office-compatible desks and chairs. Three, remodeling the apartment in the boathouse. Four, remodeling of the wheelhouse apartment. Five, remodeling of the main house apartment. Six, funding of the first duplex, now being used for our co-managers. Seven, funding of the second duplex scheduled to be completed by end of the year. And eight, funding commitment for the third duplex to be constructed in the near future. I want to thank so much the people that have steadily throughout the years given without wavering very consistently this entire time. It has truly moved us forward in many ways and on many levels. The invitation remains. So if this is something that finds a soft place in your heart and something that you would like to join in, please let me know. We will welcome you in with open hearts and open arms. So in 2014, by mutual agreement, we drew down the lake. That means to steadily, slowly um, decapacitate the dam so that the lake was uh, taken out. And then the following year, 2015, we removed the dam. Soon after, member Carol Armour assembled a group of interested parties to begin brainstorming and exploring options for restoring the wetlands that had been lost because of the loss of the dam. The project soon expanded to include a way of serving another goal, which was to manage the sand and the sediment that had backed up for that hundred years. We're pleased to announce that in with collaboration with Stantec professionals and river restoration professionals from Streamside Ecological Services and other stakeholders who have worked through this process with us and come to be part of one team. We have agreed on a design for restoring the river channel and the area that surrounds it. And to support that, we've been awarded approximately a million two hundred fifty thousand dollars by state, federal, and foundational grant sources. So the support for this has come from above and uh, from here in our area, and we're really excited to announce that we will be beginning construction in summer 2021. The project design is an approach called natural channel design, and it draws from the idea of mimicking natural conditions above and below the affected area. In this case, we use the word impoundment, the area that was impounded or that was held in place. This will include re-meandering the river channel so that rather than coming over to the west and then a 90 degrees to the east and then under the bridge, it will be re-meandered to be brought directly and kind of in a straightforward way under the bridge to take stress off of retreat road and to allow a more natural meandering of the river. 
We will be excavating excessive sediment, uh, organic material that has um, accumulated over that hundred years. And in the property immediately upstream of Song of the Morning, we'll take a multi-channel um, braided area, it's called, and reconfigure to have a single channel. Of course, the part that interests many of our members as well is that we will be protecting existing wetlands and creating some new areas so that we can hopefully enhance the area to uh, support the migratory bird population and other birds that come and nest on our property. So by far the biggest event that we have at Song of the Morning in terms of, of how many people are coming here participating is Yoga Fest. It started in 2011, I believe, um, a little before my time, but my understanding is that it was a uh, just a one-day program inviting people to come for the day and stay for the weekend and experience the universal aspects of yoga. And it struck a nerve, struck a chord with people. They were, they were hungry for it and came back the next year. And over the years, the 10 years that it's been going on, it's built into a four-day festival, approximately the last weekend in July, Thursday through Sunday, where uh, over 600 Folks came in 2019 to, to dive into this deep experience of the divine science of yoga. We have programs from before sunrise to after sunset in all of our buildings, and we also put up a couple of tents. Uh, there's vendors lining the road, a healing tent where people can go experience one-on-one -on -one healings like massage and Reiki. There's a, a lovely soul named Craig has been bringing a sauna the last few yoga fests. And it's just like, it's just alive with this, this festive atmosphere. And the programs themselves are, are deeply spiritually nourishing. You know, certainly Hatha yoga classes. There's meditations. There's bhakti yoga devotional, uh, sacred music. You know, every night in the main tent, people come, gather for this beautiful, you know, singing and, and celebrating the divine that way and uh, spiritual workshops, sound healings, then just being here with this many people, you know, the Hare Krishnas are serving food and they're singing and doing their thing. And, and a, you know, we have spiritual leaders like Swami Shankarananda who might lead a spontaneous Om circle for the peace and healing of all. Our dear friend Naren is keeping uh, a, a outside temple right along the Pigeon River where, he's, where there's Arati and Puja is happening. And so it's just alive, inviting all true thirsty souls to experience essentially the depth and the breadth of yoga. Um, and it's, it's immensely um, popular and, and nourishing and people you know, come back again and again um, because I think it, it invites people to really live yoga for a few days, you know, in service, in community, um, in just making every, that the focus of, of our, our agreement and our, our experience together. Um, and it's, it's a very deep experience. It's a very rich, very joyful, exuberant experience with quiet elements and, and more festive elements. It's, it is yoga and it is a festival. It's, it's both those things married together. And I kind of see it, in essence, like what we do, it's, it's like an expanded version of what we offer on a typical weekend, which is an invitation to come and immerse yourself in this, this spiritual energy. Uh, and I have no idea where it goes from here, but I can say with some confidence that it, that it, it is going to inform the, the next phase of Song of the Morning, just this, you know, bringing in youthful energy and this, this, this celebration and, and lifting up somehow uh, will, will continue, whether it's in its current iteration or whether it evolves. I hope you've enjoyed our program and seeing and hearing from so many of the people who make Golden Lotus what it is today. I have said this more time than once that this place has become 
to obtain this one in time. Probably <laughs> will. Well, that's come true. <laughs> Yogacharya shared his bubble of joy with all of us and I consider it to have been a friend of Yogacharya's and to this day he's my best friend but of course he is everybody's best friend. He would laugh at everything and he would say even laugh at your troubles. Yeah we would just laugh so hard for no reason and I remember that and we there would be maybe 10 people sitting around with him and he'd start to laugh and then we'd all just start laughing, rolling on the ground laughing. Even though there were a, there was a myriad of people interested in, in him and, and glomming his time, you really felt that you had a special relationship with him. And I think each of us that knew him certainly did have that special relationship. I guess I would, I would close by saying um, that my memories of, of Yogacharya are very precious. He was known as the Joy Yogi, and um, he always embodied that. Thank you for joining us, and happy birthday, Yogacharya. <laughs>